Hello, welcome to the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. Uh, this is the, the afternoon session of our meeting on Wednesday, February 17th. Uh, welcome all. Uh, here we have uh, committee members Zach Bell, Heath McDonald, Hannah Bell, Corey Deagle sitting in for Brad Trivers, uh, Trisha Altez. Um, joining us uh, is Ola Hammerland, Carla Bernard, Michelle Beaton, and Peter Bevan Baker. Um, can I get a, a motion to adopt the agenda? Corey Deagle. So today we're going to receive a briefing on the decisions of Prince Edward Island to participate in the Atlantic Lottery Corporation's new online casino and um, I'll pass it over to our guests um, and then they can introduce themselves for Hansard and then if you have a presentation you can uh, do the presentation then and we'll ask questions maybe at the end if that's okay. Great, perfect. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Darlene Compton, uh, Deputy Premier and Minister of Finance for the province. Uh, for McDonald Donovan, <laughs> Manager of Policy Planning and Regulatory Affairs for the Department of Finance. So, uh, Chair, will I just keep going? Yeah, just just keep going. Okay, Let's perfect. For sure. uh, so thank you all for coming in today and for the invitation to brief you. Uh, uh, the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development on government's approval to join the New Brunswick and now Nova Scotia shareholders of Atlantic Lottery in offering casino-style games on ALC.ca. Uh, Jennifer McDonald Donovan, our Manager of Policy Planning and Regulatory Affairs, will give a presentation shortly, but I wanted to start by sharing uh, some of the rationale for agreeing to let Atlantic Lottery work on developing this expanded digital offering for players of this province. Uh, the intention of the platform is not to create new players, it is to repatriate play from illegal, for-profit entities in other countries, back to ALC's responsible and regulated platform. Redirecting that revenue back to the province to fund important programs and services for Islanders. The reality is that many Islanders are playing these games now. Search online and you'll see just how many options are out there. And I actually did a search last night, um, 76 million results to online casino Canada. So um, there are a, and a, a huge list of all of these offshore illegal sites. So um, PEI would follow provincial lotteries in British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and soon Nova Scotia in operating, oper offering a regulated alternative to the illegal sites its citizens are already accessing. It would represent more than 95% of Canadians with access to regulate, a regulated alternative. And while Cabinet gave approval to allow Atlantic Lottery to, to develop the platform, it is still only early in the process. We, uh, we will be having discussions with health and wellness on possible harm mitigation measures and responsible ga gambling education campaigns. Atlantic Lottery has been told PEI would require wager and deposit limits that are on the low end of what is permitted and in other, uh, versus other Canadian provinces and responsible gaming features that are far superior to the illegal sites. Uh, I'll turn it over to Jennifer now and uh, we'll answer any questions that you have after she's done her presentation. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone. Um, in the interest of uh, full disclosure, I've been with the Department of Finance since 2007. Um, I did take a, an unpaid leave to work a parental leave at Atlantic Lottery as their manager of corporate communications. I've been back for over a year, but I just did want to let you know that that's that that I do have that background. So, um, so background on Atlantic Lottery in general. In 1976, the four Atlantic provincial governments established the Atlantic Lottery Corporation to offer regulated lottery games to people in the region. ALC shareholders are PEI through the PEI Lotteries Commission, New Brunswick through the New Brunswick Lotteries and Gaming Corporation, Nova Scotia through the Nova Scotia Gaming Corporation, and the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. As you know, on Prince Edward Island, in addition to its role as a regulated provider of lottery products, ALC does help support the island harness racing industry through the operations of the two Red, Shore facil Red Shores facilities. So in terms of responsible gambling funding, um, the PEI Lotteries Commission must allocate 1.5% of gaming revenue to responsible gambling initiatives. So that money is spent by the Department of Health and Wellness and it's invoiced back to the PEI Lotteries Commission. The funding currently goes to the Gambling Addiction Support Unit, and that funds two full-time employees working on research, which includes PI-specific research and policy, outreach, education, retail monitoring, resources and toolkits, 
yearly media campaigns, professional development for health PEI staff, system navigation, and a 24-7 support line. Um, in recent years, a decision was made to increase the funding to $300,000 each year to allow them to do some um, proper long-term planning. So for instance, in a year like this, where the pandemic has probably had an impact on funding, they will still get the full amount, despite the fact that it, it will be above the 1.5%. Um, the amount increases each year by the Consumer Price Index, so now we're just over $305,000. Um, but if, if we were to ever be over 1%, 1.5 were to ever exceed that, they would certainly get that. So currently, under the criminal code, it's only a provincial government or one of its agents that can operate gaming, with, gaming within its borders. The problem is that Canada does not have a way to block offshore online gaming operators from taking bets from its citizens, meaning Canadians can place bets on more than 3,000 of these sites. And a lot of these sites are... Um, in tax havens, um, they're in the Isle of Man, they're in Malta, so um, they're, not, they're not in North America. So what's the impact on Prince Edward Island? These offshore gambling sites are heavily marketed and they're readily available to islanders who do not have a regulated alternative. The minister just mentioned doing a quick search for casino games in Canada, and um, but I think even beyond that, um, the Super Bowl, I was watching it um, and there were three advertisements just in prime time on offshore online casinos. So this is an option that's out there um, and it's, it's heavily marketed to uh, Canadians. So despite having some online offerings on its website, ProLine, Lottery, Ticket Purchase, Digital Instant Games, ALC estimates that more than $100 million leaves the Atlantic region each year for unregulated offshore gambling sites, which do not return profit to provincial governments to fund important programs like and services like healthcare and education. So we do have responsible gambling features that are um, that far exceed what you would get on the offshore sites, which was a large part of the rationale for making the decision to um, look at developing something like this. So in comparison, on ALC.ca, it is, it's regulated by the four Atlantic provincial governments and subject to their laws and policies. The offshore sites, they're not necessarily bound to standards of player protection, and I think if you were to sort of go through them, you'd have some very high-quality sites um, and, and some not-so-high-quality sites, but they're not bound to any uh, government oversight in the same way that, that ALC.ca is. Atlantic Lottery has a dedicated PlayWise section, which is their responsible gambling information section on the main ALC.ca page um, and on all the other pages on their website. Um, on the offshore sites, any responsible gambling features and related information may be difficult to find and not substantive. Um, on ALC.ca, players can take a 24-hour break or even self-exclude, meaning they voluntarily prohibit themselves from online play for 6, 12, 24, 34 months. Some of these offshore sites don't offer voluntary self-exclusion. Um, and players on ALC.ca can easily set wager, time session, and deposit limits. Um, with the offshore sites, there are some that would option, offer players for um, options for a player to set a deposit limit, but in many cases, a player would have to really be proactive and call a customer support agent to do so. Um, ALC as well, they have an online responsible gambling tool. It's a PlayWise rating that helps players with confidential personal play rating at the behavioral level to help them understand their play and how it's evolving over time. Um, and I. I know, I know that you had someone in uh, recently to sort of speak to um, this, and I, I think that this is sort of what they were saying, is having that sort of information fed back to the players to get an understanding of how much you're playing and what your gambling level is. So it, it's on, it, everybody has it. You can click on it, and it will say if you're low, medium, or high risk. Um, and there's some information I'll give you on these later on. ALC's Customer Care Centre employees are equipped with tools and skills to respond to players who have questions or concerns about play. And I do know that every employee at Atlantic Lottery must take corporate social responsibility training once a year, um, and that's it's not an option. You, you have to take it, and when the time for you to take it again is, is up, you're, you're told, and it, it's non-negotiable. ALC.ca provides players with information on how games work, including the odds of winning, so they can make informed choices about their play. So what they have is, um, you know, just myth busting. So there's, you know, that mystical thinking that sometimes people might have that they sort of counter those directly. This site contains a list of helpful resources if players want to reach out to someone about their play or that of someone they know. So age verification. 
um, there's a real difference here. So you can play only with a verified ALC.ca account. It's only available to an adult, and you have to be 19 years of age or older. The offshore sites, you have to check a box saying your legal age, and you need a credit card and email. Atlantic Lottery further has um, third-party verification to confirm the identity and age. And for the online casino games, there's an additional um, level with FinTrack. So that would include um, a providing information so to prevent money, money laundering. So the prize claim process. Um, so here's where ALC, because the work has been, ha has been done on the registration side, because th that information is there when you want to claim your prize, you can get that in your bank within 24 to 48 hours. The offshore sites, because they've made it easy for you to play um, and get an account, now they want to verify you are who you are. So that happens at cash out. It can be a very long process and they're asked for personal information you may not want to share with an unregulated offshore company. And if the information doesn't match, the operator reserves the right to not pay. So you can play all you want, it's, it's getting the money out. That is, is more problematic. So as the minister said, um, provinces with regulated online <coughs> products. So Saskatchewan currently does not, Newfoundland and Labrador do not, we do not, and Nova Scotia um, still does not, but they're going to. Um, it would be over 90% without Nova Scotia. If you bring Nova Scotia in, you're looking at more than 95% of Canadians with regulated online product access. So this isn't a new uh, product. It was launched first in British Columbia in 2010, followed by Quebec. Manitoba in 2013, Ontario in 2015, New Brunswick went out in August, um, and Alberta went out, and I believe that was in October. So some questions have been asked about the average, uh, the deposit limits, the maximum minimum wager, and average bet. Um, you can see that um, for the Canadian jurisdictions, New Brunswick, which is Al um, ALC's site, has the lowest limits, and, and actually, despite the fact that um, you can, um, the, sorry, the wager limits um, do not necessarily reflect the average. So the average on one of the I slots would be, you know, $1.48 um, as opposed to some of the other provinces. And I would point out that the offshore sites are significantly higher than this. So in terms of process and next steps, um, the Department of Finance uh, went to Cabinet to get approval to enter discussions with Atlantic Lottery. There was no point in the province, um, in the department doing any work toward this um, and, and using resources if it was not ultimately going to get Cabinet approval to enter discussion. So that's where the starting point was. So now this is it's fairly early in the process, as the Minister said. So this will require input from our health officials on any additional supports they require ongoing discussions with other shareholder governments on technical standards. And Atlantic Lottery has been advised that PEI would require wager and deposit limits that are on the low end of what is permitted in other Canadian provinces and responsible gambling features that are far superior to the illegal sites. So I just wanted to show you um, a bit of what you sort of, sort of get with ALC, a little bit more information on their um, responsible gambling features. So the weekly deposit limit, um, it's mandatory. So you do, and that was something that the expert had spoken about, was the idea of having um, this be a, a mandatory deposit limit. It's, it's not optional. When you sign up for an account, you have to set your limit. And, and not only that, at least once a year, you have to change it. You can go in and change it more, but you, you absolutely um, have to change it at least that amount. So players can decrease their limits at any time and those go into effect immediately. There's there's no waiting for that. If you want to increase your limits, you're going to have to wait you're at least 24 hours. So, so that creates a little bit of a buffer. So wager limit, um, Atlantic Lottery has a, so that you can set an optional daily spend limit. Um, you can decrease it at any time. Again, the same philosophy decreases go into effect immediately, increases require that 24 hours. And then they have um, session time limits. So these can go from 30 minutes um, to a couple of hours. Um, players can set optional daily time limits. They can e decrease their limit at any time for any reason. However, again, a requested increase will take, an effect, take effect in 24 hours. So there are also some, there's a 24 hour pause button. So you can go in and say, you know what, I just need a break. I don't want to come back into this. 
um, and the voluntary self-exclusion, which um, is, is, is very easy for players to access. So when you go in and, and you're playing on one of the games, the very bottom toolbar, one of the things you find is self-exclusion. You can immediately go in there and you can self-exclude for a period of 6, 12, 24, 36 months. Um, you're, so you're, that, what that does is it immediately suspends the account. You can't log in you, to wager, play, enter tickets into two chance. Um, all communications to the player stops when they self-exclude. So that's no more emails, nothing. So we were talking about the PlayWise rating. This um, is, uh, is something that's on all of the, um, the accounts. And I know that there were questions about whether or not there was a privacy impact assessment completed and information security at Atlantic Lottery did complete one. Um, it's our understanding that OLG has something similar, but it, um, they did communicate with players in December when they were first launching this tool. But um, they, there is the, um, there are plans to communicate regularly with players and sort of walk them through the feature a little bit and, and explain it to them. It, and it really just tells players about their behavior over time. So, you know, I clicked on it this morning and was able to say, well, that's sort of what I thought. I'm, I've got a low risk here. You know, and, and if you, you do enter into some of those higher uh, risk categories, you know, Atlantic Lottery has customer care centers that can sort of refer you to someone who can provide help. So there are also reminder alerts, which is something I, I noted your, your expert um, recommended. So there's a session time reminder. So every 60 minutes, um, your players are, are um, given a pop-up reminder of let it, to let them know you've been in for this amount of time. And you have to acknowledge the pop-up before you continue to interact with the site. Um, daily time limits, uh, when you have a session time limit, you'll get a pop-up again uh, five minutes before your allotted time limit and you'll be displayed one minute before. Once that limit's reached though, the player can't make any more wagers for the next 24 hours. And a mandatory break in play, so players logged into the, the site for a, an extended period of time. Players are forced out of the site after being logged in and five minutes before that threshold, a pop-up is displayed and another pop-up is displayed a minute before they're forced out. So those are, that's the, the presentation we have for you, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll open it up to uh, uh, committee members and others for questions. Anybody want to go first? I'm sure there's a few. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Um, recognizing I'm not a regular committee member, but thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I want to start by talking about the consultation process. I heard you say, Minister, that you were planning to speak to Health PEI, um, and I'm wondering whether those are, that is the only group that you're planning to speak to before this becomes a reality, or whether that's the only group. Well, uh, that is definitely the group that we're focusing on to see what the impacts will be. This is not a done deal yet as far as what the, the limits will be uh, or what um, the back and forth is with ALC as far as the province and setting our, uh, you know, all the responsible gaming features that they have offered and, and how that looks for PEI. <clears throat> I mean, it's not a new product, product, I'll say that. So there has been uh, studies done and, and uh, uh, ALC... Um, considers the opinion of responsible gaming experts when they're when they're setting up any of their games and they've conduct, conducted socially responsible assessments during the development of, of this uh, product as well as all their other products that they've had online for years, really. Peter? <coughs> no, I understand that ALC has been pushing this on all four provinces for over a decade now, and only last year did the first province concur and, and agree to come forward with a, an online casino, that being New Brunswick, of course. And um, just so I'm clear on what commitment was made in Cabinet on December the 20th, what, what, what was actually agreed to in Cabinet on that day? So the commitment was to move forward with, um, I guess, exploring um, what this will look like with ALC. Peter? So it was not a commitment to actually establish an online gaming casino, it was just to explore the possibility of that? So, um, what, we, what we 
you know, what finance would, would like to have happen. Anytime we have a policy that requires staff resources, that we would go to executive council and seek approval. So what we didn't want to have was us having discussions with Atlantic Lottery and them sort of thinking that we're, we're doing this and they're allocating resources, which we pay for and we're out. So what we said was let's go to executive council and find out whether or not this is even and, and something that we could look at developing. So we are very early in the process. And I, I do um, want to say that um, part of our process has, has been to speak with, um, with health and with Nora McCarthy's group. And, but we personally didn't want to reach out to them before they came here when we knew they were coming because we didn't want them to think that we were in any, any way trying to slant what they were going to say. We did sort of say, look, this is the rationale that we provided. You know, we're, we'd love to come talk to you after. Um, there's, you know, we're interested to hear what your suggestions are. And I do know that um, that group would have um, people that they would regularly inter interact with. So I think that was sort of the, the, the thought process on um, who we would talk to and when. And I, I think that's, um, we wanted to wait until they were done um, meeting with committee. And, and, and I, I, as the minister said, we are very early in the process. It, this, is, this, is, um, this is a question of getting the permission to enter into the discussions and, and start from there. Peter, do you have a time when you're anticipating this will be up and running here on Prince Edward Island? There really is no specific time. We haven't set a date at all. Um, we've had discussions with ALC. It's been something that has come up at uh, meetings with the with the other finance ministers when our ALC meeting um, comes annually. And uh, I think I'd like to point out that, you know, 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't have agreed with this, right? Because we weren't doing everything online, and, and now we are. I mean, you, you can order your groceries online. I mean, we, and the public are doing this. And I think it's really important that we as a province take the responsibility, as we did with liquor and cannabis, to provide regulated, you know, safe consumption, whether it's gambling, whether it's liquor, whether it's cannabis. They're all, you know, um, they all have the ability to uh, provide both entertainment, but there's also a threat, right? So we have to, I think, mitigate the, the, the possibility of someone, you know, going down that rabbit hole. And if anyone has gone on one of those gambling websites, it would be very, very easy to, I think the limit for slots is like $800 is what you can start with. So we have the ability in the province to um, set those limits and provide a safe, regulated site for anyone who wants to do online gaming. And, and I would point out that um, every one of the provinces, the way that, that ALC is set up, every province has the option to opt in or out of certain certain products. So this is really on our timeline. So it's when Prince Edward Island is comfortable that it has done all that we can to mitigate to mitigate harm. It's when we've sort of spoken with the um, with the, the, the team at Health PEI and and are comfortable that, that we've done all we can to provide an option that is different than in what is available in the online sites. Peter? Thanks. Uh, you, you mentioned the word safe and the words safe and responsible when it comes to the province offering this, uh, this to islanders. And I'm wondering whether you mean safe relative to the unregulated Casino online casino options or just safe? Well, I would say compared to their options now, which are the unregulated online gaming. And as uh, Jennifer pointed out, uh, ALC estimates $100 million is leaving Atlantic Canada every year from online gaming. And um, it's a concern, first of all. But secondly, we, in the profits that ALC, you know, um, have every year go towards the provinces to provide the programs and services that we need. And that, that's part of this, is to be able to um, recoup some of that money that is leaving the province now and keep it here on PEI where we can provide the um, supports for islanders that have a problem with addictions. But also, let's not forget, it goes to health and education and, and all of the services that islanders expect. Peter? And Minister, uh, somebody has to lose in order for PEI to make money. And all of the studies show that that person is more likely to be a low-income islander 
that that person, particularly if they're gambling online, is more likely to be a problem gambler. Um, so my question to you is, do you still feel that this is a responsible way for Prince Edward Island to generate revenues? I would say it's no different than going to the corner store and purchasing lottery tickets or playing the rotary draw or, I mean, any of those, um, basically, they're funding something, you know, that is lacking, whether it's sports or recreation. People are going to gamble, and the percentage that have a problem are going to have supports here on PEI and, and to help them. Uh, let's not forget that a number of people, and I'm sure people in this room, gamble for recreation. It's, it's part of what they do for, for pastime and for fun, and that's not changing. And we just, uh, as a province, feel it's responsible, and the responsibility is on us to ensure that there is a safe online site like 95% of other Canadians have access to. If I, if I may, um, I think, you know, I. If you had looked at the uh, anything to do with online gaming a few years ago, it was really well hidden. Uh, you know, like if you were to try to find an online casino site, um, it 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 wasn't as as, pr as prominent. My 20 year old son um, has an account on an online gaming site. Um, so does my husband. So do their friends, and they were absolutely astonished to learn that that's not what they should be doing. Um, because they're promoting during hockey games, they're promoting um, during television commercials. It, they're highly marketed. Um, and, and so the alternative for them is to is, is not existent in PEI. So if someone were to end up on gambling online, um, the offshore provider says, uh, we appreciate your, your money and you know we, we refer you to your provincial um, health authority to, to help you with that. Um, and so the province will, apart from the 305,000, a, a good, as the minister mentioned, a good section of our um, general revenue, our, our provincial revenue goes into health care. So I think, the, I think we looked at it from the perspective of, so this is happening, um, people are playing, um, so is, and nothing is going to help those people you know, that small percentage of the population that, that you refer to that does have a problem, um, there are no supports funded for them through the offshore companies. So I think that if we, if we provided, and, and on top of the responsible gambling features that are prominent on these sites, you know, and, and we spoke about them, there's the, the, you know, the warnings, there's the, the mandatory limit setting. If you're going to play, we would hope that it would be in a place that that was more secure and, and more player um, safety focused than some of these offshore sites. And you know whether or not some of them have questionable practices around returning their funding to, uh, to their players and, and age verification issues. You know, if, if someone's gonna play, we would certainly rather it be somewhere where there's, that's an active consideration that government has oversight over, if that makes any sense. Peter. Thanks. The ministry mentioned that it's really no different from going down to the, your local convenience store and buying a scratch ticket, but it actually is very different because, well, for, for, for a whole bunch of reasons, but again, the studies show that if you are gambling online, you're four times more likely to be a problem gambler, and you're much more likely to spend money you don't have or you cannot afford to spend. Um, as opposed to going down and buying some scratch tickets. So they're, they're very different things. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the supports. You can, you've mentioned that, that the offshore casinos don't provide supports. Um, we do provide supports, but at a pretty paltry level, um, 307,000 you mentioned, I think, for this year. You, the figure that you had up there was 1.5% 1, 1. of revenues, and I'm wondering where that figure comes from. That was a policy decision that was made probably about 15, 15 years ago or so. It, it's, it, it was a decision um, to, um, you know, allocate a, a portion of that revenue over to, to um, responsible gambling initiatives. And we determined, that the department at that time, determined that it was best determined by the, um, 
the experts in mental health and addictions the best way to spend that. And I know that they do interact on top of that with there's Atlantic Lottery has a responsible gambling person dedicated solely at the Red Shores um, facility. And so they would be sharing information on responsible gambling features and, and, and the like. So, um, yeah, there's, there's certainly a, a portion of the budget as well that goes to, to health. Like, I don't think the 300000 necessarily is, is, is everything. I think a portion of our provincial revenue goes to mental health and addictions as well. Peter? Thanks. And I'm not so concerned as to where it's spent. I'm just wondering where the rationale for that 1.5% came from, whether it's ever been reviewed in 15 years, and how that compares to other provinces and the percentage of revenues that they spend. I don't know that it was something that um, that we review. It was reviewed a couple of years ago, just internally to say, you know, there were there were times that the revenue, you know, it, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to try to fund some um, so staff resources and programming based on whoever knows what it's going to be the following year. So a decision was made a couple of years ago internally to top that up. So to say instead of the one and a half percent, which is 200 and some thousand, um, let's top that up to 300,000 and then every year thereafter increase it by CPI. And so that allowed proper planning, that allowed multi-year planning, that allowed um, mental health and addictions to say, you know what, next year we'd like to do a study, next year we'd like to, you know, do our uh, prevalent gambling sort of assessment. Like, wh whatever they want to, to use that with, that we consider that um, within their purview and they just invoice it back to the Department of Finance. Peter? So, again, I haven't heard yet where the 1.5% figure actually came from, other than oh, it was I'm a sorry. policy decision within yeah. the department. So, the responsible gambling strategy in 2008 recommended a 1.5% allocation um, to uh, mental health and uh, to gambling addiction. Peter? And that was back in 2008, right. did you say? Um, was that based on studies at the time? Or? Um, we commissioned um, a, an expert to sort of give us advice. Now, I, I, will, I will say that at that point in time it, with the department, that wasn't something I was working on, so I, I, I don't want to speak too much to that. But my understanding is that um, the advice was that, you know, we, if we could earmark a percentage of that over here as opposed to just saying, you know, revenue goes to gambling uh, supports, um, that that would probably be a good practice. So that was that, and that's all I know, I know about it because I didn't have any involvement at the time. But yeah, that was the decision made in 2008. Peter. Thanks, Chair. So we heard from the expert who was here the other day that, in his opinion, that's a an inadequate amount, and I'm wondering whether there is any discussion within the department about reviewing that three, and I realize you're, you're doing it with, with CPI and it's going to increase each year, but only a very small amount. Uh, is there any discussion on whether that is indeed an appropriate amount? So um, at this point, we have had, uh, we did um, have some discussions. Um, with um, the folks in health. And so if there's something that they come up with, if, if they came to us and said, and, and I think that's what this phase of the development is for, is going back to them and said, like, look, if there's something you need um, in, with, in this area, like, come back and let us know. So, I mean, those discussions are, will more formally happen, but, but we have sort of indicated, like, look, if you wanted to do, in particular, to um, an education campaign, so, and, and I think, um, you know, is there a way also of leveraging some of the responsible gambling channels that Atlantic Lottery has? So do we get them to um, do some more proactive responsible gambling messaging? Um, is there anything in particular that they need? And we are completely open to hearing what, what health has to say on that. Peter? Thanks, Chair. Uh, so you've mentioned the health department. Uh, few times and to talk a little bit more about the proposed consultation process as you minister and I didn't hear anything beyond um, health and wellness uh, in your response and I'm wondering whether because you've had a, clearly there's a difference in opinion between your department and ALC on whose responsibility it is to define what appropriate consultation is uh, you 
yourself, Minister, have said that it would be another layer of consultation on top of what ALC has already done. And ALC, Chris Keevil from ALC said, it's not our responsibility to conduct consultation. That's within the purview of the provinces. Um, you, you again said the onus is on ALC. So there's clearly a, 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 there's a discrepancy there as to who's responsible here. And I'm wondering whether, first of all, you accept that it is indeed your responsibility to carry out significantly more consultation than you've done so far and whether that consultation will include principally islanders first and foremost, health and wellness, economic growth and tourism, um, social development and housing. There's a whole bunch of different departments here, finance of course, who, for whom this decision has a profound impact. And I'm hoping that your plans to consult will be much broader than just health and, uh, health and wellness. Before the minister answers, if I if I could just clarify something, um, when Atlantic Lottery, I think there was just a, a miscommunication in uh, in what consultation was. The minister um, um, was, I believe, referring to the consultation with, um, you know, uh, sort of the the responsible gambling experts. What what sort of research have you done to get us to this point? You know, have you consulted with the other uh, lotteries? So, you know, um, Atlantic Lottery is part of the Interprovincial Lottery Corporation, which is the uh, the body that has all of the provincial uh, lottery associations. So that's uh, the British Columbia Lottery Corporation, the West Coast Lottery Corporation, which has a number of provinces, Ontario uh, Gaming and Lotto Quebec. Um, to, to sort of figure out what's been working there and what the best practices are, um, and and sort of consulting it, you know, with the other with the other provinces. Because I and the only reason I say that is because I had sort of under I I, I don't uh, think he kind of understood the, uh, the the question as in the same way I, in my conversation with Atlantic Lottery. I said, what the, it, what were they referring to? And and they thought it was public consultations versus the consultation the minister was talking about. So sorry. What she meant by that the onus is on ALC and, and that this would be another layer of consultation? Uh, well, no, what I was referring to is when ALC developed this particular online program, there was consultation with responsible gaming experts at that time. So they have done some of the due diligence that needs to be done. And um, if we look at the four Atlantic provinces, uh, we all refer to ALC to help us make decisions regarding what online games are offered. I mean, ProLine has been on there for years and years, and and uh, I think the biggest part of this um, exercise and, and in meeting with Standing Committee, too, is to make the public aware that the online sites that are out there are illegal, and I really don't think the average Islander understands that. They see the ad on the, the boards of the of NHL games and, you know, any place that it's being advertised, they don't realize that those are unregulated, illegal sites. And I think the onus is really on the province to provide, I'll say, safer regulated uh, online sites for Islanders to use so they are not playing those on those sites. Trish? Thank you, Chair. So, uh Kind of building off of, of what you just said, Minister. So, uh, regarding uh, the public's uh, perhaps misconceptions about the legality of, of these offshore sites, has there been any effort from government to do any sort of an information campaign or uh, get that information out there? Uh, is it necessary to open your own online casino to share the information about the other ones? Well, I think this brings to light the fact that 95, it, there will be 95 or over 90% right now of Canadians playing, have the option of playing on a regulated site provided by the province. And that when you compare the offshore sites versus the, uh, all of the options that are available, as, as Jennifer pointed out, on a regulated site, there really is a huge difference. And there are people who are going to gamble online and do it for entertainment and a, a number it's 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 blown my mind since since we've just started discussing this I, I keep asking uh, uh, colleagues and and friends like how many are actually doing this and it, it, it's really mind-blowing the number of people who are using these offshore sites to to for entertainment and you know we we know that there there will be um, some people that have a hard time regulating their own self-play and do that now. And let's not forget the 
uh, the, the offshore sites that are there now. They are not accountable to any provincial regulations. They do not return any of their revenues to the province where people are spending the money from to provide programs and services. And their mandate is not to offer a safe product. So the responsibility is really on the province to ensure that there is a safe product out there because islanders are doing it. It's no different than ensuring there's a safe product for alcohol or cannabis. You know, it's part of that, to me, that whole entertainment um, package is that we have safer regulated online gaming because people are doing it. Trish? So, uh, thank you, Chair. So those um, offshore sites, of course, are, are still going to exist. So, you know, as a, it seems like a... Uh, a strange first step to move to uh, opening our, our own, uh, you know, the a an ALC online casino before even attempting to inform the public on the realities of these other offshore casinos that will still exist and will still be accessible, um, you know, for everyone, uh, whether or not we have an ALC uh, casino, online casino available. Um, also, I do want to point out, we haven't discussed the increased ease of access that comes with uh, an ALC online casino and the, the trust factor that Islanders do have. So this does open up the possibility for more people to engage in online gambling. And once we open that door, we have to realize that there is increased risk for problem gambling when people are gambling online. So there are several factors here. It's not a, a linear argument between everybody who's gambling offline is automatically going to move over to ALC and we won't be increasing the risk for people who currently aren't gambling online by opening a new ALC casino. There's a lot of factors here that are, we're sort of skipping over um, and I, I just, I'm not hearing that you've, that those aspects have really been considered or that we've explored any other options. Atlantic Water has, in, you know, uh, I guess it depends on how captive your, your audience is. Um, Atlantic Lottery has been out there sort of saying, like, these offshore sites and trying to sort of shine attention onto it. Um, the people playing, even even when they when they do know, I, I don't know that that's necessarily even um, going to be a strong enough deterrent because they are so mainstream. So even within the past five years, I, I, I couldn't have imagined five years ago seeing some of these sites advertised on television. Or, but there's been a, a mainstream accessibility um, that, that, that has happened, and it's been a slow evolution. And so, um, do I, you know, it would be ideal if people just said, you know what, well, now that we know that they're not legal, we're just going to stop playing. The reality is, as, as, as near as your phone, that accessibility is there. And, and whether Atlantic Lottery is in it or not, the, the difference is that, that people have those safeguards that I mentioned. And I think that's, you know, when government gets involved in regulating anything like that, um, it's what is the alternative. And if the alternative is that someone's going to play on a site that maybe really doesn't care as much that they're, you know, that they, they need some reminders, that doesn't have any deposit limits or, or even reasonable deposit limits or, or re reminders on play, um, and I think that's sort of where we came because, I mean, and the minister said, you know, she wouldn't have considered it even a few years ago. And, and I think that's true. I, d I don't necessarily know that, uh, you know, th the whole landscape has evolved quickly. And, and with um, New Brunswick entering and then Alberta, um, it, it's something that we, we had to look at because it, it, it is a reality. And, you know, my, you know, my, my son has a phone and it, it's, it's right there. And, and I, you know, it, whether or not someone's going to find um, an ALC site more attractive because of the responsible gambling features, uh, well, I, I, you know, I would imagine that's probably, if someone's saying, oh, I'll go to this one because they're responsible gambling features, then I think that's sort of where we're going. And I, I think the advice that we have from Atlantic Lottery is that this has been around for a long time. So BCLC entered first in 2010. Um, and there hasn't been, um, uh, um, it hasn't, problem gambling hasn't become more prevalent in those jurisdictions where the online um, games have, have been available. And I think, you know, we're actually seeing and, and referring back to the previous two experts is that the, 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 the amount of gambling addiction has, has declined in recent years. And, and I don't know that, that we could point in any way to, you know, because gambling is so broad. So if, if I go and buy a, a ticket for a hockey raffle, I'm gambling essentially. So it's a very uh, complex issue, but I think that from our perspective and, and just to let you know kind of where we started was there are a lot of people playing this 
and they're already playing. And we can't shut down the borders. I mean, if I, I believe Quebec had looked into that a number of years ago, um, trying to find a way of blocking IP addresses, block one today and there's 20 tomorrow. So it, it just wasn't feasible. In, in a world where we could, I, I, I think it would be a different conversation, but, but there isn't a world where we can. Trish? Thank you, Chair. So I think, again, a few times we're, we're conflating a few different things that really can't be compared. So again, you know, saying that buying a lottery ticket or going down to the corner store to buy a lottery ticket is really the same thing as online gambling. Of course, we know that uh, the, the risk and impact uh, for problem gambling is far higher with the online casinos than any of those other options. Um, I do appreciate, uh, you know, uh, that ALC has done some work to try to communicate to the public the risk of these online sites um, or the, the illegal sites. Uh, however, there's it's a responsibility of, of government to ensure that we are informing uh, of risks. And uh, I don't know what reach ALC might have to the general public to get that information out, nor is it your responsibility really to do that. I would say that government should have a responsibility when we're looking at uh, as a first step to if, if the focus really is on safety here, which I think there are certainly some questions as to really is that the main motivation uh, for implementing online casinos currently. Um, I do want to ask about the two reports that were commissioned by ALC. They've been referred to a few times. Minister, did you read those reports before taking this recommendation to Cabinet? Uh, I've been briefed on both the reports. But you didn't have read them. Have I, you been provided I, with them? I have. I've been briefed by... Uh, by my colleague here and as well as my department on, on what the key points were and no I haven't read through the whole report. I, I can if I, if I may. Um, we had uh, we had wanted to proactively disclose those both reports um, so we had contacted Atlantic Lottery um, and asked you know are you okay with doing this because I know that there's a you know there's contractual um, issues um, with when you when you have a study um, so can, can we just go ahead and release these proactively? Um, subsequent to that, we received a couple of FOIP requests for the studies. So um, because they're owned by the four shareholders, and we're only one of them, um, we gave that the, both studies to the Access and Privacy Office, they, and they have to consult because we are not the owner. So they're consulting with Atlantic Lottery, who's consulting with the fellow shareholders, with, the, with the, an eye to release those studies. And, and we can make those available when, when that happens. Um, so did that prevent the information from at least being shared with the minister and cabinet in full? I mean, I have to say, quite honestly, this is a pretty, a very serious decision to, uh, to open up online gambling on Prince Edward Island to, to not actually read the reports. Well, uh, I, I think a you, briefing is not sufficient. I'm just. I, I believe you were, you were provided with the information that Atlantic Lottery <coughs> provided to the Public Accounts Committee. And so um, they have been looking into this, as has been mentioned, for a few years and have been gathering research over that time. So over, over the years, you know, they've, they've, um, we've certainly, the minister would, would receive regular briefings from them, and, and those questions would be asked during that time. So, um, you know, the, um, there is that uh, constant, you know, we have we have spoken with you know we these gambling addictions experts you know there's there's no we would suggest there's not a measurable impact on vulnerable players is is what we what those studies would say um, and really a lot of it is is based on um, harm mitigation so what what can be done to mitigate um, you know uh, excessive play or so those recommendations have been implemented over time and so that was sort of what she's been told is. These are the these are the um, the considerations in our research with other jurisdictions with the offshore. These are the recommendations we have in order to mitigate any harm, and you should implement those. And that's that's what that's what we've been told. So, and they're on the, the website, so we can see them. Trish, the recommendations are on the website. Sorry, no, no, no. Atlantic Water has implemented so recommendations such as. You know the uh, the Playwise tool uh, recommendations such as um, mandatory um, deposit limits. You know those sort of things. And I and I did note the expert that was here um, did speak to some of those same things. So that's and that we would get regular briefings from Atlantic Lottery, who is also liaising with their other interprovincial lottery colleagues. Trish. 
And in uh, deciding, uh, making this decision, uh, you know, uh, were any other, uh, was any other research uh, consulted? I mean, there's a ton of peer-reviewed literature on gambling addiction and the risk of online gambling. And uh, beyond, you know, we had an excellent uh, uh, presentation last week uh, that was, you know, based on some of that literature. There's a lot out there. Was anything else looked at? The one thing I would like to point out, and it's been raised a couple of times, that you know the the probability of having uh, more of an addiction for online gambling than something else. It's been raised like four times more likely. To me, that is much more of an argument for having a regulated site for the province, so that we can we can offer that. We can't offer that right now to people that that are online gaming here in Prince Edward Island, and. It's it's a responsibility of government to regulate and play and have a safer playing site for those people that that are at risk. And you know, you've said yourself, four times more likely if you're online gaming. Well, we can turn a blind eye now and say, let the offshore people do it. But I think it's very very important that the province provides an alternative to that. And we see it across the country. That's what's happening. We're we're up to almost 95 percent of. Uh, Canadians with the option in their province to have a more regulated, safer alternative to offshore illegal gaming. Trish? And, and of course, there's nothing stopping the province from targeting resources and services to support those who are already struggling with online gambling, uh, with the current problem sites or the uh, illegal sites, um, uh, rather than opening the door for additional uh, people, more people who will be, uh, who currently would not use one of those offline sites because they are concerned about safety and they have these other concerns, but you're going to open the door for those, uh, for more people to, to become problem gamblers because they're going to be able to now access it in a different way. So there's, there's a couple of different ways to look at this and that doesn't, it's, it, what I'm saying doesn't, isn't untrue. It is, it is absolutely true that this will open the door for more potential problems. And the, the option to, to, to game on your phone is there now with, with ALC. It's adding another aspect. I mean, you can download the app, and it's, it's, it's there. You can choose to do that versus somewhere else, but what we don't offer is the slots and uh, you know the other options that are available out there. So, again, it's just one more, uh, I guess, product that's being offered that is out there for the public from thousands, through over 3,000 uh, websites. So we can turn a blind eye and say, no, we won't do it, and that means people, less people will gamble. What we've seen across the country is that gambling has not increased by offering a regulated site. That has been the, that's been the finding, that offering this site gives people who gamble online a different alternative. We are not trying to coax new players online, we're, we're, we're trying to provide a site that will give them the, the regulation and the ability to regulate all of those things that, that we saw here, whether it's limit, whether it's time, they will be notified when they've been on for so long. So it's not about bringing a whole bunch more people, from, a bunch of islanders to a gambling site, it's about providing a safer site and a different alternative to those illegal markets. So we can turn a blind eye, and there could be 10 more sites tomorrow, and, but none of them are going to be uh, a regulated site or a safe site the way that ALC will provide one. Trish? And of course, it's very difficult to track, actually impossible, uh, really, how many people are using the illegal sites currently. So I, I think uh, I, perhaps if I could, if we could see the research that it's based on, then we might get a better sense of where these quite, you know, strong statements are coming from. Um, uh, one last question, then we can move on. I just want to ask about um, regulations around advertising. So uh, there are currently rules around the advertising for illegal sites. Uh, what about you know these AL, this ALC online casino? What sort of regulations will there be in place? We also have regulations related to alcohol and cannabis. Will we see something similar? So this is as we said, this is early in the process. It will look in PEI the way that we want it to look. So if we have concerns about um, different areas, if we we have um, questions about. Um, at all like this is the time for us to be getting in there and having those so I mean that has not been determined at this point but but it, it will be a discussion point so I've not said exactly how you will regulate it it's quite a simple question will there be regulations on advertising for the online casinos through ALC that should that should be an easy question I would think well again it's a product that'll be offered 
throughout the Maritimes, if not the Atlantic provinces, but throughout the Maritimes is what we're looking at right now. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. It's to be determined when and, and, and if, uh, but we know no, New Brunswick is there. Uh, gambling has not increased. Online gambling has not increased in New Brunswick since they came on in August, and it's during COVID. So I think that's a pretty good indicator of, of where we are. Um, we will work with ALC to ensure that the product that is, is uh, offered here on PEI is PEI specific and uh, has the regulations and the parameters in place uh, to keep Islanders safer on online gaming. And ALC.ca does have ads now for, you know, to buy your ticket online if you, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there's a difference uh, between that and some sort of full-on casino style ad like you see the offshore uh, people do and, and um, I think that would be a serious discussion with us. So everything at this point, we will have um, full input into what something like that looks like. It, I, I know I'm being cryptic, but it's just, it's very early. And, and that, but that, that is a question. So there, there are things, and we have full control over that. So I just, just wanted to, to let you know that that is something that we will be discussing. Last question. Yeah, and, and again, the you know advertisements for online you know lotteries or you know uh, things of that nature that are currently available. The risk for those activities is much lower than the online casinos. I mean, honestly, this last question was intended to be a softball. Will you have some sort of regulation around advertising? And we can't you can't answer that. Even I'm not telling you what it has to be. Just recognizing that this should be regulated, like alcohol and cannabis and other things that you have actually just compared this to in this. So just will it, it's well, pretty. So, so what I would say is we own Atlantic Lottery. So they don't, they're not able to do anything unless the province says they can. So if there's a promotion or an advertisement that is offside, a phone call will be made. It, it, they, they know that, you know, we, we are absolutely looking at what that looks like. What is the promotion of that look like? like and, and I think that's, you know, I think we don't want to prejudge how everything goes. And I, I think that's what I'm trying to get at. It is so early right now that, that we want to consult with the other shareholders. What are, you know, what's happening in your jurisdictions? Because there is spillover. So for instance, if, you know, it, there's, there's an advertisement on a PEI specific channel, but if you're watching live at five, and it's a it's a it's an Atlantic, um, you know there go, there could be spillover from a New Brunswick ad or because we all do have different regulations and standards. So that that is a discussion we are going to have with them, and and I what that looks like we're still determining. Next batter, Zach. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you both for coming in. It's uh, been a great uh, presentation. Um, I, maybe this has already come up, but what is the, I know you're very early on in the uh, starting process, but what is the expected revenue? Do you have an idea on that? Uh, well, early determinations are that for the first year it would be $750,000. Okay. Zach. Thank you, Chair. And is that on par with New Brunswick, or are you based that number on, was it $100 million that was exiting PEI, or is that exiting Atlanta, Canada? Canada. Zach? Thank you, sir. And so that $750,000, that's uh, based on? That would be projections from ALC, um, you know, through their analytics about who is online gambling now and, and uh, you know, whatever information they have. Jennifer might be able to give you more of it. Yeah, so, so they would have um, net profit uh, figures, it's sort of an estimate, you know, if, and, and I, I would assume that um, it would be more an, an extrapolation of, because they have New Brunswick um, able to sort of, um, to sort of draw from that. So, you know, you, you, you adjust for population um, and they have the other Canadian provinces. And so there would be averages and you adjust for population. So it, it would be, um, that would be an expectation for the first year. Yeah. Zach? Thank you, Chair. Um, Again, I, I liked uh, the presentation there where it said, and being familiar with the AALC app, um, with all the, the regulations and the timeouts and everything that's in place, um, is that something that AALC would report to you um, on, say, for example, they know how many people are actually downloading the app or how many people are using it and what their wagers are, and is that something that they would share with the province or...? Yep. If we wanted to, if we wanted the inf any information we want from Atlantic Lottery, we, they can certainly provide us. Um, their annual report would, um, 
every year they would sort of come up with a, this is sort of where we are this year. I'm not sure if they, they, they report on revenue. I'm not sure they necessarily report on how many people have downloaded the app. I mean, it, it, and in, in fact, the app is, is a newer thing as opposed to the, the actual site. But it's certainly information we are, we're able to get. Zach? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, because I think that might be helpful in kind of knowing how many people are, because the Dr. Hodgson who presented here last time, he had said that gambling had been going down, I think, overall. And, you know, if ALC has the actual concrete data, we might be able to back something that up and give some information. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Chair. Great. Thanks, Zach. Um, Hannah? Thank you, Chair. Um, you had referred earlier to the um, uh, responsible gaming strategy as your kind of guideline for you know, that informed decision making around the rolling out programs and services and that it dates from 2008. Um, so looking at that, that strategy, um, the reference to online and that is limited only to identifying it as a future threat to the economic impact of the gambling gaming sector for PEI. It's a, challenge to the gaming sector and the revenues that it generates. Um, how does that strategy inform um, your response to online gaming, given that it dates from 13 years ago? So it, it, the landscape has completely changed. And I think at that point, the strategy really focused on consolidating the number of video lottery terminals and consolidating the number of sites and, you know, trying to figure out what um, Red Shores would be in the future. Um, you know, what, what happens to legions? You know, they, they were able to keep their video lottery terminals. Is that, you know, so those were the, the recommendations that, ca that came out of that. Um, I think that the premise is that um, we, you know, and the responsible gambling features that, that are mentioned in there. So I think it's, we're really focused on harm mitigation um, and, and, you know, sort of relying on our, our um, the team over in health to let us know, like, you know, are there are there uh, resources that you'll need? Um, is there are there education campaigns? Because you know we're totally open to all of that. But but to your point, um, yeah, it's been a, a rapidly changing landscape with with respect to online gaming. Even the last couple of years, just the the acceptability in the public sphere, the the uh, the idea that, you know, you can turn on a television ad and, and see an ad for it in a, on a Canadian television channel is is, uh, is interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I think, you know, the context on this is that 2008 predates Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> TikTok. It predates all of our social interaction and engagement. And you've spoken significantly about the impact of marketing, advertising, and, and how you connect and engage. So the online experience that we had when this strategy was developed um, doesn't in any way reflect sort of, you know, the last 10 years, let alone the last two years. Um, the other aspect of that is that when I look at this strategy, it does have some very, you know, obviously very specific and, and, and well-developed you know, direction, issue development, direction, risk mitigation around products and services, but obviously the, the online, entire online environment is not there. So I'm really wondering why or uh, how you can bring in a new product like this, which, is, you know, it's, a, it's an entirely new thing that you're adding in, talking about the amount of research and without actually updating your strategy to reflect it, because otherwise you, you have no benchmark in the strategy that you use to determine the allocation of funds and, and priorities. You've got a lot of detail in here about the driving park, about how you engage with youth, about uh, retailers, about the 1.5%, about VLTs, but this is an entirely new section, which should have a section. So why have you not updated that strategy as a priority? So, um, I, you know, I, I understand from Nora that the gaming, gaming prevalence um, survey is going to be done again. So um, we're in, we're, we'll be certainly interested to see that. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention was that the previous study did was it recommended the increase in the age from 18 to 19. So I think um, what we're doing to, in, in, in aligning that study with, with this action is making sure that, that the fundamental uh, principles behind it, which are, you know, as much as possible, um, you know, harm mitigation, keeping product from youth, um, you know, those, uh, those are in play. Um, I, and, but I would say, and I, I, I racked my brain for the past few weeks to try to, um, you know, make a comparison here. 
the, if, if it's not, um, if we were introducing a brand new game to Islanders and they, they've not heard about it before, I think it, it's different and, and I, I, you know, um, but it's already here. And so it's, it's from our perspective, it is a, a means of, of regulating something that is, is like it's, it's, we can't block it at the bridge, it's here. So what can we do to adapt to that? What can we do to offer a safer, safer alternative to players, which is, which is really where we, we came at this from? Anna? Thank you, Chair. Uh, with all due respect, that wasn't what I asked. I appreciate you telling me what it is you want to do from an action basis, but I'm looking at the strategy that informs your overall decision making. When you have a strategy that you're referring to as your key point, but it doesn't contain um, any way that you can actually articulate or identify the opportunity and the risk around this entirely new section of your, your product envelope, um, and therefore allow us to, to, to connect that to what you want to do, then there is no, um, we, have, we would have no confidence that that, that action is actually going to happen related to this, this, this new activity because it doesn't exist in your strategy. Um, and you know, the, you've referred to it as, a, as the benchmark for the 1.5% thing, but you don't get to pick which bits of the strategy you want to do. Generally, strategies should be updated at least every five years, if not more frequently. This is 13 years old. So um, I am, as the kind of foundation of some of, you, some of the things that you're making decisions on, it, it seems really odd that you would enter into this entirely new and complex venture that requires you to make very specific decisions and investments like you've spoken around, around marketing strategy, around engagement, around education, and around risk mitigation, when it doesn't actually appear as a concept in your strategy. I just, could you, uh, do you have any plans to update the strategy? Minister, perhaps that's a question I can ask you as a priority for your department. Well, I think it definitely is a priority to, to, to look at the strategy and how we move forward. Uh, as far as online uh, gaming, it is, it's, it's a new, uh, let's say a new thing, but so we look to the other provinces who have initiated that and have had it in place for, for 10 years plus and uh, what the, uh, the risk factors and what the results have been by having that uh, online option there. So um, I think as, as far as uh, the strategy goes, it was initiated back then, I would guess, because of, of red chores, but uh, it's something that we continually look at. But uh, I think for, for this particular product, because it's, it's, not, it's a new product to PEI, but it's not a new product. It's been around for years and years. And so we would look to other provinces to see what uh, their, um, I guess, what the effects have been as far as online gaming in their province. Anna? I think if we could be flexible with strategy about how we interpret it, we could also be flexible about the percentage that we allocate in that basis, looking at Manitoba offering between 4 to 5 percent of their revenues for gambling programs. Perhaps that's an opportunity to increase um, that percentage benchmark if, the, if, if we're going to be you know, comfortable sort of reviewing and, and, and being flexible with the other aspects, Minister. That's actually absolutely something that we, we can and will look at because that's part of this whole process is, is to get from, from where we are to where we want to be and to ensure that, you know, again, that we have a, a safe product. But, you know, if, again, we'll consult with, with, uh, with health and wellness on, on where we need to be uh, bringing this forward and uh, have no problem looking at, um, you know, what percentage actually goes towards helping with gambling addiction. Uh, but I'll also point out that the, the, the funds that are received through ALC go into all, you know, government departments and health being one of them. So. But if we want to really allocate more funds to, to that particular uh, initiative, then uh, we, we will consult with health and wellness to see what that should be. Hannah? Thank you, Chair. Um, speaking again to the strategy, can you provide um, a current status of the Advisory Council on Responsible Gaming? So one of the things, when the um, strategy was developed, um, the initial thought was that a, a, a council would be developed. Um, and. I think the, the recognition was that we didn't want to duplicate services. We didn't want to have uh, mental health um, and addictions, um, you know, them sort of offering something uh, already and then the, the, this council sort of saying, well, maybe, you know, you could do this. Um, it just seemed a, a, a more logical um, step over time when, you know, in, 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 in the passage of time. Now, I, I, again, I go back to saying I didn't directly work on 
the strategy per se, but my understanding of it at the time was that um, we determined that um, it was better served to give that money directly to, to health um, so that they could allocate those resources accordingly. Anna? Thank you. And it's not actually acting, asking about money, though I'm pleased to know money went somewhere, but um, more and more the strategy feels a little bit like um, a box of elastics because this, this, the strategy is really clear that there it is the Advisory Council on Responsible Gaming will be formed with a clear mandate and goals. And for Hansard, um, the Council um, is, would be established to offer guidance on the distribution of the funding dedicated to Responsible Gaming Council and would also provide advice on collaborative responsible gaming initiatives with other jurisdictions and um, review and consider research pro proposals on gaming study and examining the effectiveness of existing and future responsible gaming initiatives. So it wasn't necessarily just about you know, allocation of money to decide you know, what programs we're we going to choose, but also to actually be that place where these decisions could be informed perhaps you know, with additional input. Um, that council was meant to have members from addiction services, post-secondary institutions and responsible gaming staff so it would be outside, um, in, outside the government space. Um, so I'm really concerned to hear that, that there's another aspect of the strategy which was designed to provide some kind of um, accountability structure um, and provide the kind of input that we're asking for right now about this. Um, and again, you know, you're, the, the strategy, the, the intent of it and the way it's being referred to is it is not just sort of like a suggestion of nice things to do. It was actually the guiding strategy for responsible gambling, yet there's an entire chunk of it which you've just decided that you, not you personally, but decided just we weren't going to do that. Um, and now we see why it might have been a good idea to have it in place. Um, so, so again, Minister, you know, has the, the requirement for consultation isn't to be to create a delay, the requirement for consultation is to ask for input as objectively as possible from as many informed sources as possible, and that's what this council would have done. Would you consider putting an advisory council in place when you review that strategy? That's definitely something that we can bring back to, to the department to look at, and also in conjunction with health and wellness, uh, you know, see where we need to go. Anna? Thank you. And, and health and wellness through the addiction services would have been representative on this council. So again, it's kind of missing a, it's kind of redundant. Are you saying that we didn't need it? it, it you did. Um, how, was this council ever in place or did, did it just never happen at all? So uh, my understanding is that um, as the, the, the immediate recommendations were, um, you know, the site consolidation, the reduction of terminals, which required um, a lot of interaction with getting sort of those machines out of certain locations, um, increasing the age. Um, I, I don't know. I, I know that those were the ones that were th the first priorities. Um, the the council. I I don't know exactly the evolution of that. Um, my understanding is that over time it was determined that um, that. You know, mental health and addictions was was uh, well positioned to, and, and and they do you know within their mandate they do research, they do PEI specific research, they liaise with responsible gambling experts, um, they provide training for um, health PEI staff, um, they they liaise with Atlantic Lottery and their counterparts in other jurisdictions, and um, so we just that that's where the funding went. So I, I I can't tell you any more about the decision making process at that time than that. Anna. Thank you, Chair, and to reiterate, I'm less concerned about the funding and more concerned about the advisory and accountability function of an something called an advisory council. That's exactly okay, what it's designed to. I appreciate that. I said you've been referring when we introduce the strategy into the topic. Then, then it, it's a touch point that is being referenced for certain decision making that's happening around around this, um, particularly around the, the the percentage of investment. Um, you mentioned about oh, also. To clarify, I just um, I mentioned the responsible gambling strategy because it was asked where we came up with the one and a half percent. That's all. Yeah. Anna. Thank you. In in light of there being no other strategy, this is the strategy, um, and this is what is what is informing. You collect the funds through that, and then th that informs how those funds are allocated, and the scope of how they're allocated. So if that changes, then that needs to be updated because otherwise we don't have a basis for making informed decisions. Um, and I think, you know, I'm really pleased to hear the minister sort of commit to, to the, you know, perhaps updating that piece. Um, 
the frame, there is a framework in that strategy about the allocation of funds that are, that are generated where the funds are specifically to go to, uh, as you said, community-based, particularly around sport, community, charitable sector and health. Um, and so um, there is a framework for, for, uh, for those funds. Um, and Minister, do you have kind of a, is, that, ha, is there a formal framework or is that pretty loose in terms of, like do the funds go into a specific space and get allocated from that or do they go into general revenue? So, so, we, um, so I think one of the the charitable um, aspect of it was the was uh, dealing with uh, charities like bingo. So that sort of thing. There was a charitable bingo strategy a number of years ago, and I think that speaks to that. Um, the the revenue, apart from that one and a half percent, would go into general revenue. Anna. Okay. Thank thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess my you know following on from my colleagues' questions about um, if we have a percentage. So you have the money going in, all the revenue goes into general revenue, and then there is a, a percentage allocated from that under the one point, well, 305,000 now. And is that then transferred, all of that transferred directly to health for the delivery of their programs under the, that umbrella of the, like the, the health plan? Well, they invoice us back. Oh, okay. But there's a direct, a direct connection yes. that way. Okay. Um, I guess, just Chair, if I have just one yeah. other one on this one, then allow it to circle around. Sure. Um, just regarding advertising, and you'd mentioned this, and obviously there's it's um, pervasive uh, um, advertising across multiple platforms. Challenge again here of, of the space we're in now, but but we need to be really clear that advertising that appears on on um, traditional platforms. Um, like billboards, um, television, radio, and all that kind of thing, and, and, and authorised websites must meet um, both CRTC guidelines and legislative guidelines that are advertising standards and legis legislation. So illegal like illegal gambling sites can't advertise legally. They, if, if we're seeing ads for illegal gambling sites, that's, those are the ones that are popping up when you're on a website, for example, where those regulations are not in play because that website is not hosted in Canada. But a Canadian-hosted website or a Canadian TV channel or radio or anything are bound by CRTC and by um, um, uh, other legislation that, that protects both the consumer and the, and the provider. So, so I appreciate that there are illegal sites out there, but I think we need to be really careful that there are also a number of legal sites that may not be very good. Yeah but they are not illegal. So not every online gambling site, and a lot of the popular ones are actually legal, and they are allowed to legally advertise. They may not, we may not like that, yeah. but there, and there, so there are two different sets, right? There's a, there's a set of sites which are making tons of money and sending people offshore, but they're advertising legally. Yes, so there, there's a, it, it's a, it's a gray area at, at best. Under the Canadian Criminal Code, the only people allowed to provide gaming within a jurisdiction is the provincial government and their or their agent. So uh, it is that that some of these sites, I mean, can come here and and, and open up to us. Um, yeah, it it is a it is a big problem. And I guess the, yeah. I guess the other yeah. distinction as well is that you can have an illegal advertisement, but the site itself is not illegal. So so I think we just need to be really careful. Um, that we that we are talking about that we're not using big broad strokes, even though they're the bad guys, that we're not using there's big a, broad a, strokes. Yeah. No, yeah. There's there's a very wide yeah. spectrum. So you'd have some of the more mainstream, and some of them have offices that would be based in the United Kingdom or the United States. You have way more that are that are offshore and um, and and are not looking to be legitimized in North America, and 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 those are sort of out there, but. Um, you know, the 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 idea that they're legal is is um, is a question because under the criminal code, um, I would say gray at best because I can't buy um, a, an, an, a lottery ticket in Ontario from PEI. I go into Ontario and buy a lottery ticket when I'm in Ontario, but I can't go online because they're only for Ontario residents. So. The offshore sites are, um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly a, a, a spectrum. Anna? Thank you, and I think that's, that's the thing we need to think about is that there's a spectrum, right? That this is so, it's so broad statements on, on any topic are dangerous, and the, and the same here. I mean, uh, just in the same way that um, we can manage jurisdictionally um, where and how we advertise, you know, we can manage jurisdictionally what is and is not available. Um, 
but there are some things that are out of scope of what we can do, but they don't all fit in the same box. Um, Chair, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there and we'll come back if anything. Thank you. Michelle? Thanks, Chair, thank you for your presentation, for being here. Um, I just wanted to jump off something that um, Zach had asked about, about the $750,000 in revenue. I might have misinterpreted, but um, that is specific to PEI. That's not Atlantic Province revenue. That oh, is. Correct. So. In the first year. In the first year. So in the first year for PEI, we're projecting $750,000 cleared. Can you tell me what the cost of, of the platform is? I can get that information. I don't have my glasses. I can. I have the document here. If that. <laughs> I dealt with that all morning. I did. Can zoom in. Um, so the incremental cost. So we'd be going in in year two. Oh my goodness. I don't know that I. The minister may be able to to read this. I can get that for you, Michelle. Yeah. Honorable member. Okay. Michelle? Um, thank you, Chair. So, but do you know what the cost of the platform is? Like, just... It, it, will, it would depend on how many shareholders are, are, are in the platform. So, um, so for instance, the, the figure that, that was presented to public accounts makes the assumption that... Um, it's just Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. So I don't know if Newfoundland and Nova Scotia were to, the PEI and New Brunswick rather, so if Nova Scotia and Newfoundland were to ultimately come in, that would fluctuate as well. So I guess the answer to that is we will have a better sense at the point where PEI was prepared to go in, we would have a better sense of, of what that would cost because we would have all the information before us and we could certainly provide that back to the Public Accounts Committee. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks, Chair. And the document that you're going to provide us, does that have revenue estimates for future years as well? For the, 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 the information that Atlantic Lottery gave to the Public Accounts Committee? That document right there, is that oh, the, that's one? the one? That's the, the, the information that Atlantic Lottery provided the Public Accounts Committee. Okay, thank yeah. you. So you already have that. Okay. Sure. Um, so in Atlantic Lottery's annual report, they have performance targets, performance to targets that they measure, so key performance indicators. And one of those key performance indicators is the total number of weekly, monthly, yearly players on ALC. So I'm just looking this, in this year, so the target was tw for 2019, 20, 2020 was 22,500, but the actual was actually about 5,000, more than that. So my question around that is, are there targets for bringing people online to, to ALC um, aggressive? Do you know what they're what they're targeting for people? To I, think, I think their their targets would be, um, um, you know, and that would include people going on to buy a six forty nine ticket. So those I think they would be just sort of extrapolating on numbers you know, throughout other lotteries, the Canadian population, the percentage of people. Um, I think what they're trying to do, and I think what what our department has always said is, is it, and I mean, it's been made clear to Atlantic Lottery from our perspective is we're not interested in creating brand new players. Our focus is on repatriating play. So it's, it's moving people that are already there from the offshore onto, onto ALC.ca. I think that's sort of um, been our message to Atlantic Lottery. Michelle? That's fair, but I'm not quite sure Atlantic Lottery got the message because they sent out an email to all dormant email accounts that were on their ALC.ca website or platform. So I don't know how many, I would love to know how many emails that was that they sent out offering them a $20 credit if they reactivated their, um, their accounts. We have no idea how many of those people were recovering addicts. We see them advertising on Compass so even people who don't necessarily use the internet a whole lot, you've just grabbed them on probably the most watched um, program in PEI, offering them a $20 credit. On Facebook, we see a sponsored ad offering a $20 credit. So to my colleague's um, point, when we talk about regulating how advertising is going to happen, 
I don't see us ever offering a $20 credit to the liquor store. I'm sure some islanders would appreciate that, but we don't do it because we have regulations around it, and that's why we don't do it. So, um, and my understanding looking at the legislation is, is there's no regulations when it comes to online. There are in possibly other areas, but so where, where do we stand right now in that responsible, that doesn't feel responsible to me. So, so um, I'm not going to disagree with you on what you just said. Um, we saw that ad and um, the minister sent notice to Atlantic Lottery that that's not to happen again. They are not to um, try to incentivize with a, um, with a cash bonus or credits um, to, to uh, non-players, uh, to people, to your point, who hadn't been around for a long time, is it's not to happen. So um, that the promotion, uh, that twenty dollar promotion, is currently being pulled in Prince Edward Island. Um, it's and the reason why it wasn't pulled, the minister sent a letter to Atlantic Lottery advising that that would also, you know, include, um, you know, anytime you're going to send something out in the mail to or, or or the like, to try to incentivize people to go to the website. That's not where we want to be. So. Um, at this point, because there are four provinces um, involved in the uh, in the back end of the technical side, it's going to take it was going to take them a couple of days. The anticipation is by the end of the week that will be fully pulled um, from uh, for Prince Edward Island players. Um, the, in terms of the advertising, there could be um, the spillage, so someone could see that promotion on live at five. It, but what will happen is there will be a, a something written on the back side end slate that says not available in PEI. Uh, players who log on um, will not be able to access it. So that that the minister sent a letter to them, advising them that that, that was, and that will also guide our discussions with Atlantic Lottery on our expectations for advertising and promotions going forward. Michelle, thank you for that. Um, so. Can we, will, do you foresee that there'll be legislation come forward that would be similar to tobacco, liquor, cannabis when it comes to advertising? So as, as, as we stand now, um, the only, um, you know, ALC.ca advertises as a way of, of buying your, your lottery tickets. Um, you know, th this is part of the discussion going forward. So what do you... What what is what is the interpret you know what are, what do you expect to be doing in the other jurisdictions because as as I mentioned earlier every province has control over the promotions and the products available within their their borders and you can geofence as much as possible players may be aware of, of things um, there are things that happen um, so you know their customer care center would be informed that you know every province has the ability to determine. Um, promotions in their in their jurisdictions, um, so yeah, I mean we we absolutely and and I think we're so like this is this is early days and um, we will there will be some parameters around that anyway. I'm not sure exactly what that takes because we're still at that sort of phase in it. But yes, that's absolutely a point that we're bringing forward to Atlantic Lottery again. Sure. One more, and again, it's around the advertising, and I'm looking at advertising because. If we're not trying to create new players, then we don't advertise it, right? And you know, when you think about just all of the other platforms of ALC, so you know, Lotto 649, um, the scratch tickets, all of that, um, lotteries play on the hopes and dreams of making it big, of, of getting that lucky ticket, right? And all of the advertising of ALC is, you know, happy people holding big, big checks, and you know how they're set for life, and Life is grand now because they hit it big. And the concern about, um, so one thing, if it's you're buying your weekly ticket, you're actually usually going into a location and you're doing that and there's limitations that's, that's organically created from that aspect, although now you can do it online. Um, but VLTs, we see that all the time, and we see a, the, a huge percentage of the $18 million, I think, of our revenues, $11 million of it, was created through um, video lotteries. And we know that that is because people are doing the next spin to maybe make up for what they've already lost or the 
the machine feels like it's going to pay out today. And I think that that's part of the problem is, is gambling sets that, you know, sets that it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. You just got to keep playing and you'll hit your numbers big. So is there any discussion around how the advertising to people um, will be addressed so that it's not such a wonderful story that happens to such a very, very small percentage of people. Yeah. I think the, the focus of our discussions, um, and we can certainly discuss that um, back at the department, um, I think at this point our, the focus of our discussions is on, um, was, has been on the, what the online um, component would look like, but we can certainly have a broader discussion. Great. Heath? What else there is to ask? <laughs> it's a good discussion. Kind of sitting here, you know, thinking back to when uh, VLTs were introduced back in the 90s and kind of goes through the same same process. You're, you know, there was, there was always talk about, well, if government does it, it'll be safer and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we soon came to realize that it wasn't much safer, but it was somewhat safer, and uh, they started pulling machines back in. So it was long before our time in politics, yeah, any one of us. But so I think there's, there's, you know, the the whole discussion here today is really good and relevant, um, and and understanding now that Executive Council uh, was presented with this for information purposes, I, I'm assuming that there was no voting on it or anything in that regards, by based on what you guys were saying. So there's a lot of I's to cross, or dot and T's to cross, left in what everybody had to say here. But one thing I think it's gotta come first is, you know, if Nova Scotia's putting 3.1 million in and we're 7% of that population, our rough estimate would be about $450,000 to cost us to do this. And we're only putting 1.5 back in on an annual basis. A pretty good return on investment. And when those the group were in last week and said, we said, well, what's your budget? And they said 300, I think it was 300 and some thousand. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. And that was two employees. I think we're, we're missing where we're going with this and we're missing it on the front end. We shouldn't necessarily be talking about the gaming aspect of it and all those questions we should be first talking about, and some of us have for sure, talking about what can we do here to ensure that no matter what happens, no matter if it's existing gamings offshore or gamings that the four Atlantic provinces are going to do, do we have enough supports? And I think, you know, any minister, I think, is going to stand up and say, we better have our butts covered on this because it will. There will be people. We see them every day. Every one of us knows somebody that's been affected by a VLT. So I think that first and foremost... Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to what you guys come with, with next. Um, and I understand the position you're in, but I also understand that for the last 10 months, COVID-19 has put so much emphasis on mental health and addictions that we as a legislature, as committees, better not turn our backs on it because there are people that are hurting in society. So that's all I had to say because there's nothing else to ask. Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, honorable member and it's I mean the decisions aren't made for the report in tw 2008 none of us were here for that and you know I can't defend or or really question I guess I can question but it, it is the report that it is and uh, any of the comments that came to me today will be brought back to the department and uh, you know we'll have the discussion with health and wellness about how we move forward and you know, how much is needed for, for, for mitigation in this. I mean, we know what's happening, and we want to ensure that the people that have a problem with gaming are have resources at hand here on PEI to deal with it, and we also want to provide that safer site for them. Um, just we're heading to the, uh, the end here, um, so we'll just have a, a couple more. Peter, you have a couple more questions? Uh, yeah. Despite what my honourable colleague said, I do have a couple of questions. <laughs> uh, the first one, I'm just tr trying to get a, a straight answer to this. Are you going to consult with Islanders? I'd say you have to be determined. You have to be determined. 
we're in early days of this. Um, um, and we've had gambling experts who have who have uh, worked with ALC to ensure that the games that they provide are are as safe as they can be, and that they are uh, all of the mitigations in place to to ensure that Islanders play responsibly. Peter. So is, is that why not? Because you feel that ALC has done the consultation that you that is required? Well, I think that's part of it. But also we look across, do, as, as, as mentioned in a number of committees, a cross-jurisdictional scan as to what the mitigation were put in place for all of the provinces that, that have online gaming now as an offering. I think there's no better place to look than provinces that are doing it now to see where they're at. I mean, we talk about cross-jurisdictional scans for everything, all the decisions that we make, so this will be one more that, that, that we will do. Peter? We talk a lot about consultation in this House and the importance of it. Um, it strikes me that this is both a very important topic and it's certainly generated a lot of interest among Islanders, so I'm, I'm struggling to understand why government would not make, it, it would be no question that you should ask Islanders how they feel about this. Well, I appreciate your, your input, and, and I'll bring that back to the department. Peter? Thank you, Chair. Um, David Hodgins, who was here uh, and spoke to us, uh, talked about the number of the impact of, or the potential impact of offering a regulated government online casino. And and he said, and I'm going to quote from, from what he said, it may, it may draw some people away from the unregulated sites while also drawing in new people. So do we have any studies? A number of times you've said here that uh, this is not going to impact the number of gamblers. Show me the studies that support that statement. So those would be the two studies. And, and I, I don't know that... I think that we're trying to, I think he, he sort of divided gamblers up into gamblers and problem gamblers. So someone like like me who would say, you know what, I'm, I think I'd like to buy my lottery tickets online um, is, is a very different player than someone who, who would, would um, play um, in, a, in a harmful way. And so the studies that, that are there, and, and we, have, we are going through the process of, of the, the disclosure now, um, I think that what like our understanding is that it won't have a measurable impact on the vulnerable players, and there hasn't been um, an increase a, a, um, an increase in prevalence in problem gambling in those Canadian jurisdictions. So while you may you may get a new player who goes on there, so so I'll give you an example. Occasionally, my husband and I will go out to supper at a pub, and we'll each throw five dollars into a video lottery terminal, and uh, that might happen once a year. And I, so I, you know, I would, I guess I've gambled with a video lottery terminal. That's very different than, than the experience of someone who just does it more regularly and even more different from someone who does it more than that. And so I don't know that, um, I, I guess the, the gambling prevalence study uh, will tell us sort of what those, um, what those numbers look like, the, you know, how many people are playing online. And, and I think those are the th sort of things we look at. Like any time a study like that comes out and they say, you know, we're seeing, you know, and we would monitor that. So is, if there's a, a you know, a, a, a sharp increase in the number of people that are spending a lot of time online, well, we'd have to question that. So I, 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 all I can say is that we, we will provide the studies that, that we, that, you know, w when we're able to, that we would we'd be happy to share those with the committee. Peter? Yeah, you can understand why it's difficult for legislators to to accept the, the rationale for moving forward with this, and you make a statement like it's not going to increase the number of gamblers based on two studies that we cannot see. And coming from an organization um, that asked for those studies or conducted those studies, they didn't do them directly. I understand that they asked a couple of external organizations to do that. But ALC has been trying to push an online casino in all four provinces for 10 years now, unsuccessfully. Perhaps during COVID, and, and there's no doubt that the numbers, um, that their revenues have decreased during COVID. We're not exactly sure how, how much of an impact it's had. The last numbers we have that were, that were released in October 2020, just a few months ago, um, actually PEI received almost a million dollars more than was forecast for that fiscal year. Now that, of course, COVID is going to impact the next fiscal year more than it did that fiscal year. 
but revenues were not in, not significantly down from that from that first year. Do you have any sense of where revenues are going to be with ALC? I'm, tr I'm trying to understand why they are suddenly successful after 10 years of failing based on two studies that we can't see. Well, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, that everything is, is, is tied to the, the two studies. I think it's also tied to the fact that, you know, as part of the Interprovincial uh, Inter Lottery Commission, they have the experience of looking at what's happened in other areas of the country. So they have the ability to say, okay, well, this, this happened in British Columbia, it happened in Alberta, uh, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, right? So they have that sort of um, uh, knowledge base to, to draw upon. So there's that. And then, then there would be the two studies. And so over a period of, of a couple of years, um, yeah, there, there would be some sort of um, repeated request from Atlantic Lottery to consider it. And, and I think because they're seeing that those numbers are going offshore. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think where the department landed on it was, I guess, during COVID, the number of those um, offshore ads really intensified. And so you're seeing a lot more, more people online, and they're getting hit with with offers to go onto these sites. And and the promotions, I mean, the, the $20, you know, we, we've sort of spoken about that. But, but the offshore sites are offering a lot more than that. So there are a lot of people that are sort of going to those sites. And it's it's how can we how can we sort of offer a, a, a safer alternative to, to what's currently being advertised. And, and to your point on the studies, I, I, I understand that you, which is why we, we wanted to proactively release them, um, and, but understanding that, you know, um, and I think the, um, one of your guests this morning I heard was saying, you know, sometimes departments want to release things and they have to consult. And I think that's where, where you find the Department of Finance today, is we'd love to be able to just, and, but we, we have to consult with other, the other shareholders as we would want them to consult with us, I'm sure. Peter? Thanks, Chair. Um, and you just brought up that, the incentive, the $20 incentive. Uh, earlier in the presentation, I think, you, Minister, you said that ALC can't do anything without the blessing of the provinces before they do it. And we've just discovered that ALC did something that clearly you're upset about and have put a halt to. How did that happen? Well, I think it was, um, and maybe I'll get Jennifer to speak to it because okay. I'm not sure about the process as to how they came to that. But once we were aware that it was happening, um, I immediately contacted them to say I didn't want it to happen on PEI. So, um, Jennifer, I don't feel that. So, um, the minister sent a letter to Atlantic Lottery and said it was not acceptable for, for this type of promotion. I mean, the whole rationale for PEI entering the online space is not to create new players. The, the ra our rationale has always been to repatriate players who are already out there. So this is this is sort of it, it was it, we were surprised by the ad um, and. Um, they were told this is not to happen again. Um, and so they fully in their, you know, they, they sent a letter immediately and said, we're absolutely going to comply with this directive from the minister um, because, and they, they phoned me and said, look, this ad is happening in four provinces. If, you know, we, we could end up pulling it from those four immediately. If we, if we pull the plug on PEI, it impacts the other shareholders. Um, so, but we're going to get rid of all PEI advertising. So there could be some spillage um, with the, uh, like on some of those channels that if you have a global channel that's based in New Brunswick, you might see it because it's New Brunswick. But um, any sort of advertising on PEI channels like Compass was, was not going to be happening. Um, furthermore, the, the back end of it, the technical side, um, it, as computer systems being as they are, in order to untangle PEI from the other four shareholders, they had to, um, there's some work being done. I'm told it would happen as early as the, it will happen by the end of the week, possibly Thursday, late Thursday, early Friday. But, but there's, they're not, they're not uh, marketing to island players currently on that, and, and they won't do that again. Nor will they do. Nor will they reach out to players who, um, to the honourable member's point, having been on for a while, haven't seen you. Here's a here's a credit. So that sort of reaching out to to players to say, why don't you come over here? Is not is you know, that's not going to happen in PEI. Okay. Peter. Thanks, Chair. So I understand the response to the action by ALC. 
I still don't understand how that could happen if ALC cannot do something that's not condoned first by the provinces. Can you explain how so, that So happens? Atlantic Lottery has the permission space. So we have asked, Atlantic Lottery is owned by the province and the other three provinces. So, so, is, so we don't have to duplicate services by holding, having a lottery operator in each of the four uh, provinces. So the permission space is what they have to working within the regulations and the uh, the legislation. What are we able to do? And so for them, um, I guess this is new. Um, and there was I I don't know what the thought process was in 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 launching that, but um, they were let they were told that it, it wasn't appropriate for us. Peter, we have about. Ten minutes left. Sure. Trying to get through. Still an unsatisfactory answer for me. I have to tell you, uh, you know, if ALC is mandated to only do things that are that are okay by the provinces, and yet they're doing stuff like this, which clearly was a surprise, and not a nice surprise to you, then then I, I think we need to look at that, and somebody needs to have a chat with ALC and 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 find out how how on earth that happened. I'm also a little concerned at how the advertising was going to all four provinces, where at the moment we only have an online casino in one province that... You can, you have a, an ALC app on there, and so PI and Newfoundland, all of the provinces can go on and do a bid on ProLine or 649 or any of those. So any of the products that they offer on their app now, that that is what the $20 credit was for, under my understanding. it. So I guess for New Brunswick, it would mean you could also use yes, it for, okay. for the... I apologize, my misunderstanding. For online, right? Sure. So moving forward, if we go um, to online casino, we can specify that PEI does not have that type of ad go forward. But it was for anyone who has the ability now or registered with ALC for any of, you know, their products, I guess, is what I understand. Peter? The, we, we've talked a little bit about repatriating gamers who are currently using uh, off-island sites. Do you have goals as to how, what percentage of them you hope to repatriate with an online casino here? Um, 100% of them. You know, if, if the option, if the two, if the alternative is they're playing on unregulated sites that, that maybe have responsible gambling features or they're playing on Atlantic Lottery that has responsible gambling features and, and sort of the behavioral um, uh, monitoring that um, the PlayY system has. Um, you know, and I, I don't know. I, I, I think that wherever possible, what we would say is um, if Islanders are going to, to play, they should play um, in, a, in, a, in a regulated way um, and, and not to play with, you know, to play within their limits. Um, Peter? I'm going to squeeze our heads with a little bit of math here. You said $100 million is leaving the Atlantic region on these sites. We have 7% of the population, which would suggest that $7 million is leaving Prince Edward Island for these sites. You've estimated a return on this of $750,000 in the first year, which is about 11% of revenues. ALC typically um, has 40 over 40% 40 returns. If you look at the income versus money given out, it's but it's almost 40%, approximately 40%. Here we're only going to get 10%. So what? why are we pursuing something that is clearly so less profitable? I mean, if we're going through all of this idea that we're doing this out of kindness and responsibility to islanders, um, why are we pursuing something that's a, such a low return on dollars compared to all of the other ALC products? I think that for the first few years, you're you're still going to have people playing on those, you know, until they're aware that there's an option to play on on ALC.ca. I think it's going to take some time for them to come over here. But but I can I I would like to reiterate that that the department of the, the the position of the Department of Finance is not to create a, a a large body of players and to grow the player base. It is it it always has been. To repatriate that play, and I don't know that we can um, how how quickly that will happen. I don't know when that will happen, but but it's certainly that that's the the re the rationale for the department and, and for putting forward the proposal. Peter, I realize that we're close to the yeah. buzzer here. Um, I, I want to finish by talking about VLTs because a large portion of ALC's revenues, more than half of it that comes back to the province, is generated directly by VLTs. A 
clearly an online casino will have a large component, which is VLTs. The study that we have cited a number of times, or the, the strategy from 2008, one of the clear recommendations there was to reduce both the number of VLTs and the number of sites in which they are there. So we're clearly violating one of the very few clear recommendations from that strategy. Why are we doing that? So the video lottery terminals, um, one of one of the, re the rationales for the consolidation was to make sure that when they were in a location... Sorry, it wasn't a consolidation. The, the, the clear directive was to reduce sharply. That's yeah. the word they used, the numbers. It's not consolidating. It's a sharp reduction. And so, we're going completely against that with this online casino. So the, those sites... So there, there were site standards that were introduced at that time. So instead of having a video lottery terminal here, a video lottery termina, that terminal there, they, they were consolidated, the number of sites was reduced, and the number of machines were reduced. So it was a reduction on, on both counts. So, um, and, and a part, on one of the other things that, that happened was there were um, standards introduced on, you know, having responsible gambling literature. There were a number of other things that were added. Um, I, I would say that when you compare video lottery to, um, to the online casinos, again, I go back to the fact that, that the online casino is there as soon as you open your phone. We are, we are not saying that, like, if, if, if we could re regulate a way to, to, to have it so that they weren't here, but, but that's not an option before us, we're, we're trying as best we can to mitigate harm, I guess is, is all I would say about that. Yeah, uh, clearly, the same argument keeps coming back, and I understand w why you are, are saying that. Um, but I, I think we absolutely need to make the point that, that just because government can do something doesn't mean that you should do something. And it's just so clear that online gambling is problematic for a significant portion of our, our uh, population here on Prince Edward Island, leading to approximately two people taking their deaths each year. Uh, because of prob problem gambling, and you've said you're not going to consult with Islanders, and that you're going against one of the clear the clear suggestions in the 2008 gambling um, responsible gambling leadership integrity <coughs> and responsibility a responsible gaming strategy for PEI, and I'm just I, I, I'm very disappointed um, that government is not at least reconsidering whether or not we, we should do this. I know ALC said that, stated very clearly they wanted this up and running in the first half of 2021. You haven't given us a timeline as to whether this is coming, but I really hope that government reconsiders what they're doing here for the very small amount of money they are getting. There are all kinds of places where we can gain revenues here if that is an issue, and I'm sure all governments are looking at ways to increase revenues. This is not where we should be looking for it, and I really strongly urge you to reconsider the decision that has clearly been made in Cabinet to go ahead with this. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just point out to you, we all have this on our desk now. We didn't have that 13 years ago. So the ability to, to game versus going to a site where there is a VLT is a totally different thing. And this is happening. Whether we like it or not, it's happening. Uh, I, we are just trying as a province to be responsible in the and providing a safer option for Islanders. Michelle? Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of quick ones. So is there money in the 21-22 budget that assumes we've launched an online gambling casino? Okay. And uh, so for the cannabis, um, we PAC had uh, the board for um, the Liquor Commission as well as Cannabis Management Corporation come in and, and when we asked about um, how much of the illicit market they have um, taken, um, we could only speak to, Can they could only speak to Canadian numbers and didn't even really know if those numbers, you know, were accurate. Do you know how you're going to actually identify if you've actually repatriated, repa um, repa oh my gosh, sorry, you know what I mean, repatriated? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do you do you have a plan that has been developed for you to be able to measure that? I think that will be part of, you know, between now and, and, and you know when this is offered, if it is offered. And uh, I'll also point out with cannabis, part of the reasoning behind having legal legalized cannabis is so we can have a safer, more regulated product for Islanders. So, you know. 
part of the reason. The other yeah. reason is to remove the illicit market, which is what you're saying you're trying to do yes. right now. But we launched that without having a plan of how we were going to measure how much of the illicit market we've taken. And I'm asking, are you going to launch this before you have a plan of how you're going to measure how many um, gamblers, how many people are using online gambling in other sites? It's, it's very hard to determine how many people are using offshore sites. But the flip side of that is they have no other alternative here on PEI. They do in New Brunswick. They will in Nova Scotia. They do in 95% of Canadians, or close to 95% of Canadians, have the option of using a safer, more regulated site. Sure. Final thing. Perfect. But if we are saying that we're doing this for a specific reason, we have to have measurements to be able to show that we've accomplished it. Otherwise, we're just doing it for the sake of doing it and showing no benefits, like showing that you're not actually accomplishing what we're saying we've set out to do in the first place. So not really a question, but I find that we launch a lot of things without ever measuring it. And so if we're not going to measure it, you can never say you're successful. Trish? So just one question for clarification. So the two reports, um, the Game Res and Responsible Gambling Council, I believe those were the two, were they were actually commissioned by ALC, or they're just two reports that ALC chose to... Uh, I believe they were commissioned by ALC. Okay. So I just, it, it's, it's, uh, it I have a really difficult time with that, to be honest. It's, it's not directly about online gaming, but it does help us under, or it's a problem that we can't see those reports. And you say that we can't see those reports because of the contract. So, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm saying. Sorry. I, my, my, that we are, we're trying, we're going through the process. So we're there because we're only one of four shareholders. We had wanted to proactively release them. So we'd have them here for you and you could sort of ask us those uh, about them. So we asked Atlantic Lottery um, and so, um, they are consulted. We gave those to the. It subsequently, re we received a couple of FOIA requests for them. So we're going to. We presented them to the Access and Privacy Service Office. They're sending them to Atlantic Lottery, who will consult with the other three shareholders, and then we, we would, with the eye to release them. Trish. Okay. So that. So the problem is, uh, you need to have permission from the other provinces to release it. We're only one owner of Atlantic Lottery. There are there there are another three, and in the same way that if if someone were to ask for, a, I guess, a, an asset from you know in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, or uh, New Brunswick, they would consult with PEI. And and I don't know. I don't anticipate that being a long process. Trish? So I will just quickly say I still see that as, as quite problematic. Uh, quite honestly, that ALC, which is responsible to the provincial governments, and the provincial governments are responsible to people. There, there shouldn't be a, a, a possibility for any provincial government to block, um, you know, research that was paid for through ALC. That just should, that shouldn't be possible. Anything that is commissioned by ALC, quite honestly, should be allowed to be made public. Like I just, I, I feel like. Well, I don't feel. I see that there's a real problem there in terms of transparency. That's not for you to answer today, but I certainly, you know, would be interested to know what the process is to resolve that so that we're not in a situation where you're saying decisions are being made on reports that nobody can see. That's problematic. And, and I, and for what it's worth, I don't anticipate any of the share, other shareholders having any issue with the release of the reports. Um, but it, it is a process that we work through, and I think it's probably going to be an expedited one. But um, it, it's just a matter of, of I, you know, because we are only a quarter uh, owner uh, of, of the assets that, you know, we're just going to ask the fellow sh governments, um, shareholders, if, if um, just to let them know. And because they may have requests, there may be something in there that, um, that refers directly to them. I, I, you know, I, that they may sort of want uh, some information on, um, I, I don't know. But anyway, it'll, They'll come back. Great. Um, on on the um, the list of services, there was something on there. It said my offers um, before on one of the slide presentations. What what was what's my off? What what would be in that? So I I checked on I went in and checked on mine today, and I don't have any offers. Um, I I don't know if that's um, so. Here's an example of one. Um, if you play Proline and you bet on hockey. Um, they had something recently where if you bought a, a hockey ticket, you could get an, an additional hockey ticket or something like that. 
but I, I, I checked. I don't have any current offers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just worried about that for, for promoting more gambling on, on the site. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was looking at there. Um, when to get to this point, um, there was a petition in June um, with the BIPOC community. Uh, they talked about looking at things through a racial lens. It went to cabinet. This decision went to cabinet. Was it looked at through a racial lens at that time? Was there any discussion of how it would affect um, ethnic and racial minorities? So it, it went to cabinet to basically to discuss moving forward with it, and that will definitely be part of what we do as far as um, moving forward with ALC. Okay. Yeah, because the research in this case, when you're talking about gambling, ethnic and racial minorities have a higher rate of gambling problems. So I think that would be good to note too in the, in, uh, as you move forward with this. But um, thanks a lot for giving up so much time today. Um, yeah, the committee appreciates it. And um, we will take a short, very short research, come back to, to finish our, our meeting. And uh, I appreciate it, I guess. Sorry, Ola. Yeah. Um, just back to move on to number five to finish up the meeting. Uh, discussion of scheduling. Minister Thompson was unable to make today today's uh, visit. Um, at this time, the committee has a few options for next steps. Uh, wait to meet with the minister on a day is available or request a copy of the report to be provided to the committee to review in camera. That would be without the minister, because obviously if his schedule doesn't align, um, the committee could go ahead and request just for the report to review. Um, and then that in-camera bit was uh, to align with the original motion that included it to be in-camera. Uh, Court? I, I, I wasn't at the last meeting, but I'm guessing. So we requested, we subpoenaed the report, right? Or, yeah, there was or, a... I don't know the exact wording, and then... So I guess I'm just looking for some background. Mm -hmm. No, um, that's fine. So at this time, we have a request out for the minister um, to appear with an unredacted copy of the report, and that was to be in an in-camera meeting. Um, and from my back and forth with um, his office, we weren't able to find a date that he was available to come in. Um, there was limited options given just because the calendar was so full. Um, so it's up to the committee how it would like to proceed. but. At this time, he wasn't able to make the, the dates provided. Court? Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. Anybody else? Trish? Yeah, I think uh, we asked for the report. We subpoena the report. We can get the report for sure, and then we have the minister in when that's possible. Okay. So, is Minnie okay with that? And just to clarify, subpoenaing would be a different process. Is it the wish of the committee just to send a letter requesting it at this time? 
Trish? What is the process for us to get the report? I, I mean, this back and forth, like, we just want the report. Yeah. Let's get it. That's my thought. Everybody else can. Consulting with the Parliamentary Council and the other clerks, it was the recommendation from them. Um, and I agreed to go forward with sending a request for just the report at this time, just because his schedule doesn't align. Um, it would be, I guess, the next step just to ask for the report. Court? I thought we had already basically did subpoena, or just we asked for it. We asked for it? Yeah, we, we have. It was a strong strong request, yes. So. Court? The response we got back was that they don't have a, they can't, I don't know how many dates we offered them to meet, but yeah. they couldn't, couldn't make it in on those dates. So basically right now we're looking at, we wouldn't meet again until probably, assuming the legislature sat for like six to eight weeks, like, Possibly in the May. There is always the option of offering a Friday afternoon if the committee pro wanted to prioritize it. Heath, did we ask for the report? We asked for the report alongside the minister. Not the report by itself. So that's what's being recommended as the next step. If we can't meet with him on his schedule to have him come in, or sorry, to not have him come in, but the report be sent to the committee. To review in camera. Yeah. Try that and see where that goes. Because we don't have time anyway, so. Perfect. Can you be okay with that? Trish? Just, to, I'm sorry, just looking at my calendar, we don't have another scheduled meeting of this committee before the next sitting, correct? No. So is there there's no mechanism for us if we just send out a, another can we please have the report um, and the answer is no there's really no mechanism for us to choose to subpoena the report until after the next sitting is what um, would be the case my understanding is the next steps would be possibly including it in the report to the legislative assembly that it wasn't provided I if we did get the report and we wanted to meet, that's always an option, too. Oh, do we? Trish? I guess I am just unclear at this point why we wouldn't just subpoena the report instead of sort of playing this back and forth game. Uh, but I'm open to hearing why. I mean, I just, I feel like it would be very beneficial, uh, you know, for us to be able to see that report at this point, you know, before the next sitting. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna have to wait a very long time uh, to resolve this. So I just don't see why we wouldn't just go ahead and do what is fully within the rights of this committee to access that information. I'm open to discussing it further though. I am. Why not? Anybody else? Uh, I think we asked for the report and potentially asked for it within a certain amount of a time frame. Uh, we want to see the report within 48 hours. Corey? Did, did we put a time frame on the original request? Yeah, and it's it's it was t 10 day. Yeah, the, um, the time frame that was provided, um, I believe there's only one or two dates within that open to uh, be presented, and those were unavailable, so I came back to the committee and asked if I could provide two more dates. Um, those two dates were also unavailable, so at this point, um, I guess it's up to the committee if you want how you want to proceed mm -hmm. um, but of course like you said we could uh, attach a deadline to it um, yeah. I would suggest I'd, I'd like to see the report by end of business day on Friday um, well okay. Trish if it's not sent by Friday though then what right I just I move that we subpoena the report. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and move that and people can vote it down if they want, that's okay. Okay, our motion's on the floor. Just oh, take clerk. Can we just take a recess for a second? Recess. Sorry.
Okay, um, we're back, and uh, after that recess, I just want to have a discussion with uh, the committee and uh, a couple of things that, that there is a motion on the floor um, to subpoena that document. So, um, but that would be potentially missing a couple of steps. Um, the step would be to um, ask for ask for that uh, report um, and have it come in with a strong timeline associated with it. We can always you're in your rights to subpoena that, but it doesn't mean that we'll see the document any any quicker. So if we if we were to um, we can subpoena that any time in the future, but um, as per right now, it might just be asking for the report strongly um, in the letter saying that we have the the notion to we could subpoena that in the future but at this time we're just asking with a timeline will you get us get us the report then the committee could come together anytime in a meeting and subpoena that report it's got to be the subpoena process has to be it's it's a little bit more detailed oriented we would have to just sit down and have a meeting and and try to word that properly um, but uh, so the, the course of action right now would be to, we can vote on the motion to keep it going, that's an option, or we could have a unanimous decision to um, maybe move on that, ro that route, that secondary route, um, but we need, need it to be unanimous because there is a motion on the floor. So, Trish? Um, yes, all right, so good point that the committee can meet uh, at any time, uh, including, you know, while the legislature is sitting. Um, so, okay. Um, we, we did already ask for the report, quite honestly, but I see, like, I'm looking over the, the wording of the original motion, and, I mean, perhaps... Ew in retrospect, the way that we worded it, we really did tie the minister and the report together. So, okay, I'll withdraw my motion and uh, I would, you know, perhaps encourage that, you know, we strongly insist that the, we get the report and a timeline for that. And we schedule a meeting if we don't get the report by that timeline. Uh, yeah so that we can take this next step. And can we, as you had said, Chair, like, can we make it clear in the letter that that is the next step, we are aware of it, and we will take it? Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah, like, we not will. we will take it, but we are aware that that is the next step, and we'll be considering that. Obviously, we can't say we will take it, because we'd have to vote on that, but, yeah. okay, others thoughts. Definitely. Uh, Corey was next to speak. Um, I think that's, uh, I think what Trish said was fair. Um, she, uh, we had just discussed earlier the what was in the original motion, I think a couple weeks ago, and um, it said that we would ask the minister to appear with the report, um, and that I think within a time frame, and if they didn't, that we would insist that they do. So I guess we laid out what our steps were, so if that's our next step, and then I think clearly say in the letter that um, what our other options are and that we're, the committee would look at. Yeah, would certainly look at following those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Looking into those future, I guess, uh, I'm not trying, trying to find the word here, but look mm -hmm. into those uh, options, yeah. Next steps. Yeah, perfect. Anybody else? Is that okay? So, um, we can, can, it, can we get unanimous consent that that motion has been taken off the table? Okay, perfect. Um, uh, the next steps would be we'll we'll write that letter. Hopefully, we'll we'll send that letter out to tomorrow um, by just, lunch. So, Trish, I just want to be really clear about the wording in the letter. So it's yeah. that we are asking for the report, and we welcome the minister to come to the committee, but that's not conditional on us getting the report. We want the report. Hopefully, the minister will come as well. But if yeah. not, still want the report. I just want to make sure we're being clear this time, so there's no loophole. Absolutely. Yeah. So then, um, did did the committee would the committee like to set a date upon a, a time frame that we can work, give the minister to to produce that report in this letter? Yes. <laughs> well, what's reasonable? I don't know. Like, 
Um, yeah. I would say <laughs> Monday <laughs> afternoon, end of business day would be what I would be thinking. Suggested, I'd suggested Friday, but that might not be. I don't know. I, Corey, chair, I don't. I think what we gave them two weeks in the first letter. Do we say two more weeks, and then that's kind of? I know. I think maybe are you trying to think like are you thinking along the lines of if we're going to meet again, we want to get it in before the house sits, because we can meet when the house is. Although I don't, I think it's preferred we don't, but. Um, if we have to, like if we think the committee feels like it's needed, then they can. Mm -hmm. um, I would be fine with a couple of weeks, but I, I'm only one person, so I don't, sure. I don't know what the other members think. Sure. So, uh, Zach? I think you're giving e at least a week, and if you're also using the wording of, you know, if this is what we would prefer, but, you know, however it is worded, like this is our other option. So. I don't know, it gives us maybe a little bit more time, so I would say at least a week. That's maybe what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, a week. Just no more than 10 business days. There we go, how about that? <laughs> I think that's, that's generous. Fun language. One week. Sure, one Put week. Put in there okay. one week from today, please, clerk. Thank you very much. That, that's okay. Okay, so that is, um, is uh, did we cover everything? Good. Okay, so we'll get that, and then we'll we'll maybe uh, Corey. Well, I'm just curious. So we're saying one week. Are we saying one week for the minister to appear with the report, or just to provide the report? Provide the report. Just to provide. Just just to provide the report. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's it has it, it's not tied to the minister. It's actually okay. very exclusive. So perfect. Um, and just to clarify, uh, Trish had mentioned to include that the minister is welcome to come. Uh, if you would like, and as long as that's okay with the committee, I just want to make sure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, just we already invited the minister, and I just. Yeah. I don't think that's a problem. Yeah. Okay, so um, that was scheduling, and um, anybody have any other new business at this time? Okay, great. This meeting, can I get a motion to adjourn? Zach, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>